In this video, we will explain the Wigner 3J symbols. In short, they are a different way to denote Klebsch Gordon coefficients containing the same information but in a much more symmetrical way. First of all, when you couple two angular momenta in quantum mechanics, you can make use of Klebsch Gordon coefficients to express the coupled basis in terms of the uncoupled one. Now, for every Klebsch Gordon coefficient, there is a corresponding 3J symbol. To be more precise, the definition of a 3J symbol goes like this. It looks like a 2x3 matrix where we have an angular momentum in the upper row and the corresponding magnetic quantum number in the bottom row. But this is just a symbolic way to denote a real number, it's not a matrix. Okay, so where does this come from? Wigner realized that if you couple three angular momenta using the 3J symbol, the result is a state with zero angular momentum. This is obviously a very symmetrical way of looking at angular momentum coupling, whereas with Klebsch Gordon coefficients, you always have to say which two angular momenta coupled to the resulting third one. Now that we have our definition in place, here are three useful rules to determine whether a 3J symbol exists or if it's zero anyway. First, the values in the bottom row have to behave like magnetic quantum numbers to their respective angular momentum. For instance, if j1 is 2, then m1 cannot be 3 or 1 half. Second, the sum of the values in the bottom row has to be 0. This is basically the same condition as for Klebsch Gordon coefficients, where the magnetic quantum numbers had to match. Finally, the values in the upper row have to fulfill the so called triangular relation, which is the usual relation for adding angular momenta. There are two more things we can mention. First, the sum of the values in the upper row is always a whole number. Second, using the condon shortly phase convention, all 3J symbols are real numbers, just like the Klebsch Gordon coefficients. Now let's talk about the main reason why we use the 3J symbols, symmetry. In fact, you can perform 72 symmetry operations on a 3J symbol, which all leave it invariant. Let us now go through all of them. First, if you do an even permutation of the columns, the value of the symbol will not change. You can also do an odd permutation, but in that case you have to multiply a phase factor. Next, you can flip the signs of all magnetic quantum numbers, and if you include the phase, the value stays the same. This corresponds to a time reversal symmetry of the participating JM states, since under a time reversal the magnetic quantum number picks up a minus sign. This is due to the fact of how spherical harmonics transform under complex conjugation, since in position space time reversal is just complex conjugation. Furthermore, there are two so-called Regi symmetries, which are a bit more complicated and look like this. So how do we know that those are exactly 72 symmetry operations? Well, showing this takes some time, but it's worth it. First, we write our six elements of the 3J symbol inside a so-called Regi symbol. Again, this is not a matrix, just a convenient way of placing the values in a 3x3 three three grid. Note that the sum of all columns and the sum of all rows is equal to J1 plus J2 plus J3. Now, whether we permute any of the columns or any of the rows, this fact won't change. Also, if we mirror the entries along the diagonal, similar to a matrix transposition, the sum stays the same. However, mirroring along the other diagonal is not an independent operation, so we don't count it. Now, every symmetry operation that we mentioned earlier can be expressed via some equivalent operation on this Regi symbol. Here is how. First, the even and odd permutations of the columns correspond to exchanging two columns in the Regi symbol. Next, if we exchange the second and third row, this corresponds to flipping the sign of the magnetic quantum numbers. Mirroring along the main diagonal, like doing a matrix transpose, corresponds to the first Regi symmetry. And exchanging the first and third row corresponds to the second Regi symmetry. This is not immediately obvious, but you have to perform the operation on the Regi symbol and then set it equal to the initial Regi symbol. Let's take the second Regi symmetry as an example. If we exchange the first and third row, the first column of the Regi symbol will look like this. If we now claim that this is still a valid Regi symbol, 
it should be equal to some other 3j symbol, where we use uppercase letters in order to distinguish them. By comparing just the first column and adding those two equations, we see that the new uppercase j1 is given by 1 half times j2 plus j3 plus m1. And this is exactly what goes in the corresponding spot in the 3j symbol after doing the second Reggie symmetry operation. So we have six ways of permuting the columns, six ways of permuting the rows, and the mirroring along the diagonal, which leave the Reggie symbol invariant. Therefore, there are 72 symmetry operations. Finally, let's talk about how we can use the 3j symbols. Imagine you have a certain Klebsch Gordon coefficient and you wonder what happens if I put a minus sign here or if I exchange those two numbers. Well, if you write this Klebsch Gordon coefficient as a 3j symbol, you immediately have access to 72 symmetry operations, which all correspond to different angular momenta but lead to the same value of the coefficient. We also have to mention the wigner eckert theorem here. Since it involves klebsch gordon coefficients, it can also be written in terms of a 3j symbol, like this. Now you can do two things. First, by using the three rules we mentioned in the beginning of this video, you can easily check if the result on the right-hand side is zero or not. Second, you can do a bunch of symmetry operations and thereby easily investigate many more matrix elements of spherical tensor operators without having to calculate another Klebsch-Gordon coefficient. And that's pretty much it for this video. Thanks for watching.